The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, reading from verse number 14. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 5. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Father, I do thank you tonight for the privilege of being in this church once again. I thank you for its ministry. I thank you for the faithfulness of the servants who serve here as pastor. I thank you for those that have been faithful to the church over these years. I pray for your anointing upon each that we would not just understand what the will of the Lord is, but act like it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I preach to you about opening the package. I preached it on Sunday twice. The fact is that God has an ordained package for every single one of us. The scripture that I just read to you, let me give it to you in a little different manner. Everybody repeat that to me, please. I will exagorozo. Oh, come on now, everybody. I will exagorozo. A kairos. Out of my chronos. I don't know if you know it or not, but if you've ever been to the eastern countries, an agora is a single market. An agorozo is like our malls. It has a bunch of markets in it. And to ex agorozo means to purchase once and for all. Now, if we're going to purchase once and for all, when I say I will ex agorozo a kairos, the word kairos is not the convenience of the season, but the necessity of the task. You can read it when it says in the book of Galatians, Be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap in due season. The word season in the Greek is kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, which literally means it's not the convenience of the season, but the necessity of the task. Every person here, I preach to you about having an ordained package. And if you open the package, you're expected to use it. If somebody buys you a nice gift, wraps it all up, if they did it at Christmas, if they did it for your anniversary or for your birthday, you are, it, surely you have the brains to open the package. If you understand that concept, let me see your hand. And he buys you a nice gift, you at least have the decency to open the package. Amen. You see, it really doesn't matter how it's wrapped. Sometimes, if somebody wraps something up really, really, really neat, you figure it's going to be really, really worth something. The package does not denote the contents. And sometimes what we face on a daily basis we may not recognize that the package that God has ordained for us may be right there in front of us. Just because it's not wrapped in a beautiful little package. And just because somebody doesn't come around and say, here it is. Here's your package. See, I got news for you. If somebody writes you a nice check, hello, which somebody did 
for me today. Amen. If somebody writes you a nice check, are you smart enough to go cash the dumb thing? Hello? It's amazing to me that Walmart, he don't want your check that somebody else gave you. They'll tell you, no, you can't do that. The banks, if the person who wrote you the check is not got money in the bank, sorry about that, it's nothing but a piece of paper. Hello? I said, it's nothing but a piece of paper. Over the years in our travels, we've had a lot of folks buy T-shirts and books and things that give us checks. <laughs> That's why I really appreciate the attitude of your pastor. Write it all out to Wellspring, and if it bounces, I'll deal with it. <laughs> I love that. I can tell you put a smile on Miranda's face because she hates dealing with folks who write bad checks. Amen. Hello. But every now and then, people don't mean to. They, they, by faith, they feel like, oh, I'll have the money when the, bank, when the check gets there. But the money ain't always in the bank when the check gets there. Hello. And so sometimes you have to deal with however the situation comes. You can't lose your salvation over a dumb check. And we can't lose our fellowship or our, or, or, or our feelings toward other people because they might have wrote us a bad check. And the thing about it is with God, there ain't no such thing as a bad check. Hello? Hello? Redeeming the time. Ex agarozo a kairos out of my chronos. In other words, to purchase once and for all a unique moment in time. See, when he says redeeming the time, the word time is chronos. Everybody's got one on their wrist. If you've got a wristwatch on, hold your hand up. You have a chronos. Your lifespan. I'll be 81 years old in two weeks. Maybe two and a half weeks. But my chronos will be 81. That's how old I am. And so everybody has a chronos. But when I say I'm going to ex agarozo a kairos out of my chronos, what I mean is I'm going to purchase something once and for all out of my lifespan. How many knows that if you purchase something, it would be kind of be, show a little bit of ingenuity if you were to use it? Hello? You see, we have a daughter, bless her pee and heart, uh, we, we, we have a daughter that she, she got on drugs several years ago, and, and, and she just went from the leader of the pack down to where everybody's ashamed to be around her. She actually looks about 20 years older than me. I could tell people she's my mother, they'd believe me, because she was on drugs for so long. And, and she figured out how to work the system as far as government is concerned. Getting grants and getting, getting taken here and taken there and medicine here and medicine there. And, and I don't know how in the world she figured all that stuff out, but I can tell you there's a lot of folks who got that down pat. Amen. If they can get it for free, they'll do it. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, she's done that. She hadn't worked in years, but she lived just fine. When, the, when the, my grandchildren went to move her out of her house in Benicia, in her garage that she couldn't get a car into because it's full of stuff. And they were all shocked. My oldest son went to help her. And he, got, he called me and said, Dad, do you know what Karen has done? And I said, no, son, I don't know what Karen has done. What has she done? He said, she has filled this dumb garage with stuff of a What? QVC. She has filled this garage with stuff off a QVC. Sat around with nothing to do and watch television. See something that struck her fancy. She'd buy the dumb thing. Boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff in the garage hadn't even been opened. She had no idea what she had. She couldn't sell it because now it's used. Still in the box. The label's still on it. It's never been opened. But she can't sell it because it's used now. Hello? And most of that junk, you can't sell it anyway because there ain't nobody else as dumb as you to buy it from Q QBC. Hello? <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> but the, <laughs> I don't have a lot of patience with that. My wife fusses me all the time because our, our daughter, on her drugs, she, 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 she's nuts. 
She sees people looking at her out of her house. People are crawling around her walls looking at her. People are overhead crawling between the ceilings, between her and the floor. And the fact that it's only 10 and a half inches thick and only 16 inches wide don't make her no difference. Ain't no men built that way. But, there, but there's a guy up there looking at me all the time, Daddy. Over there in the wall, there's, there's cameras looking at me all the time. I went over and looked over the wall. Mom went over and looked over the wall. And I said, Karen, there ain't no cameras over here. Yes, there is. You guys just can't see them. Yeah. I finally <laughs> didn't have to see my daughter. She's all wonker-jawed. And, and I said, Karen, when's the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror? What do you mean by that? And I said, what man would want to look at you 24 hours a day? I can't imagine why she got mad at me. But my wife got mad at me too. She said, don't talk to her like that. I said, well, she needs to get off drugs and wake up. Hello. See, here's the bottom line. We have the ability to control our future. And when you add God in the mix, I said, when you add God in the mix, hello, I said, whenever you add God in the mix, you don't need QVC to fill your longings. Hello, I said, you don't need QVC to fill your longings. She didn't need those whatever you call them to fill her longing. But God loves us enough that there are times he gives us the desires of our hearts simply because we ask. It was no big deal for them two cans to fly into that tree for God. Hello? And the fact that he did it when three women prayed, three two cans show up. See, you don't understand God. He said he's like a father. How are you with your children? I can tell you my wife tells me she is our daughter. Yes, yeah, she is our daughter. So we're still talking to her. At least, at least mama is still talking to her. I don't talk to her much because I, I ain't got the, I ain't get the patience to fool with a drug addict. But, but here, here's the bottom line. We haven't give up. We're still praying for her. Amen. I said, and one of the desires of my heart is that my daughter will find Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of her life and change everything about her, and she can do it. Amen. At one time, she was a strong, strong Christian. What happens to people? I don't know. When you lose sight of who you are in God, everything else goes, if I may put it bluntly, everything else goes to hell in a basket. Amen. Because when you lose sight of who he is in your life and who you are in his kingdom, there's no telling what's going to happen to you. There's no telling who's going to be allowed to take advantage of you. It's no telling what's going to happen to your body, no telling what's going to happen to your mind when you don't recognize that God is your Father. Amen. And not just your Father. He's a Father who cares about every little thing. That's why he can send the dumb toucan to light in the tree. So these three girls who pray will each see their own toucan. Amen. Ain't no even three of them looking at one when God can bring three, one for each prayer. Amen. So you see, God wants to, wants to open, wants to have you, help you open your package. See, at, at 81 years old, I used to think, at 62, before all those books back there, I used to think, I've done everything God ever told me to do. I have done everything. I, 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 I gave everything away. I, I, back years ago, I'm going to tell you this. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> we did the, the Full Gospel Businessmen in Illinois. And there was, a, there was a TV station that one of those uh, uh, something or other, C, something or other, what was it? One of the, one of the little dinky stations, not, not the big, uh, 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 yeah. And, and they asked us, said, would you come in and do an hour? And I said, what do you want us to do? I said, anything. Just, we'll just turn the cameras on, you just go for an hour. Well, at the time... Uh, we all played our own music. My wife on the piano, me on the bass. A young lady that traveled with us played the guitar, and we had a young guy named Randy playing guitar. We all played our own music. And, uh, and, and we just went in and set everything up, and we did an hour. Never thought any more about it. Left. About a month later, they tracked me down at a church in St. Louis. I was at Brother Shockley's church. 
Brother Shockley is the head of the Assembly of God for the state of, Illinois, or state of Missouri. And they tracked me and found me at his church and wanted to know, when are you coming through? What was the name of that dumb town? Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. Yeah, Mount Vernon, Illinois. And, and said, when are you coming through Mount Vernon? I said, well, actually, I'm coming through there next week. Oh, wonderful. You've got to stop because there's going to be a meeting and you need to come and meet these people. And I said, what? What for? I said, you just need to come. Uh, we'll, what time can you be here? And I told him, well, I, I don't know. We can probably get there about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. We'll make it 11 o'clock. My brother Jimmy showed up out of nowhere, unannounced, wanted to go with me. And when he found out I was going to a TV station, he said, what are you doing that for? C-A-T-V, that's what they are. I said, what are you going to some dumb little old C-A-T-V station for? And I said, I don't know, Jimmy. They just called and said, would we come by? They wanted to have a meeting with us. And he said, well, if they want something out of you, I'll be your manager. <laughs> and I said, Jimmy, they ain't going to want nothing out of us. He said, that's all right. I'll be your manager anyway. So I said, all right. So when we went through the door, the little secretary said, Mr. Tharp, Mr. Tharp, come here. So I went over. She said, don't sell out, Chief. They want you bad. I said, what are you talking about? She said, see that basket over there? They had a, uh, had a big old barrel-like thing that no, it had, it was made out of mesh so you could see inside of it. The thing was completely full of letters. And she said, that's from you. I said, we have tried everything at this station to get some response, and we have got none until you come along. I said, all them letters is because of you. And said, there's men in there, they want you bad. Don't you sell out cheap. And boy, my brother said, yep, I'm the manager. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so we, so we went in, and sure enough, they had a big old round table and about six guys dressed fit to kill. And they said, Mr. Tharp, we would like to sign you to a 13-week contract. The guy at the end spoke up and said, 26, 26 weeks. He said, okay, 26 weeks. We'd like to sign you to a 26-week contract. And I said, what am I going to do? And they said, well, we want you to do what you did the other day, whatever you did. Just keep doing it. We want you to do it. And said, we'll pay you $85 a program. Jimmy spoke and said, what kind of idiot are you? I want to give my brother $85 for a program? And the guys kind of looked at each other and kind of bewildered. And the one said, well, that's each time it's shown in 3,800 television stations. <laughs> my brother's eyebrows went, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> And Jimmy said, well, it's not going to be done for $85. They said, well, how much do you want? Jimmy said, 95. They said, we'll go 90. I said, yeah, that, that's all right. That's all right. Because 90 times 3,800 is a lot of money. They said it'd be played two or three times at some stations. And however many it's played, you get $90 per time. <laughs> My brother insisted on 95. And I'm on, I want to tell him, Jimmy, shut up. But... <laughs> But they, they agreed, no problem. And so I said, well, I'll tell you what, before I sign any contracts, let's get my equipment to hit here because they said, uh, they said, you have to understand, this is Ed Sullivan Productions. Anybody ever heard of Ed Sullivan? So this is Ed Sullivan Productions, and he has to have uh, the, the, what do they call it, artistic, the lad, last artistic rights, something like that. In other words, he's got to go through everything you say and agree or tell you he don't, or don't like this or don't like that. And I thought, what, what in the world? If you just want me to do what I do, what do I have to answer to Ed Sullivan for? Well, they said, let's, leave, well, let's, let's try it. Took me, it took me one hour to do it before. It took an hour and a half, including loading the equipment back in the bus. And it took me 13 hours to get a program down that suited those turkeys. They stopped me after every song. What's that mean? After everything I said, what do you mean by that? How come you said that? What do you mean? What, what, what's that line in that song mean? What, what, what's that all about? 13 hours. And I said, guys, this ain't going to work because I'm booked fully. I, I ain't got a Sunday. I ain't got a, at that time, I'm in revival everywhere. I'm in service every single night of the week. And I said that for 26 weeks, that means I'm not going to do nothing. I've got to cancel 26 revivals. And my brother's telling me, it, it'll, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. We, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And I, 
And I, so I refused to sign a contract. My brother, I don't think he ever forgave me because he's counting up his 10%. Because he whispered to me when the first thing came, I get 10%. <laughs> he, he's, figured, he's already figured up his 10%. If we're in 3,800 or 3,800 stations, uh, and he's figured up his 10% of $95 that each one of them only played it once a week. And I can tell you, we walked away, and I never looked back. I didn't care. Because I, the ministry is what's important. And I felt like God gave me a package, and that was to preach in churches, to encourage people in churches, to encourage pastors in churches. I felt like that was what my goal was in life. That was my, that was my package. And so I felt like that if I did anything beyond that, if I did what they said, then I'm selling out. There's been a time or two when I was broke, I sure wish I'd have sold out. <laughs> I sure, sure wish I'd have sold out for, for about 13 weeks. <laughs> well, anyway, and so, and so about, it wasn't six months later. Uh, may, no, I'll take it probably a year later. I was in revival again with Lester Shockley. He had a big Assembly of God church, Florissant Assembly of God in St. Louis. And Brother Shockley uh, got, called me one night after we was out, out to eat, and he said, by the way, I'm picking you up at 9 o'clock in the morning. I said, what are we doing? He said, we're going to a meeting. I said, do I need to be there? He said, I think so. It's about you. I said, what kind of meeting is this going to be? He said, you'll see when you get there. I'll pick you up at 9 o'clock. So he picked me up the next morning and drove me to John Paletsi's Assembly of God Church, John was the head of the Assemblies of God for the state of Illinois. Lester Shockley is the head of Missouri. And sitting in there was about 35 preachers and a young couple. And they introduced me to the young couple and said, Brother Tharp, this is what we want to do. You've been to our, all of our churches, and Jimmy Swaggart has been to our churches. And we're, you're having better results than Jimmy Swaggart is. And he's now in auditoriums. We think you should be in auditoriums. And we're going to hire this young couple. We're going to pay their salary for one year. They're going to go around and organize the churches and the auditoriums. And whatever you take in is yours. We'll pay for the halls. We'll pay for them to do it. And whatever you take in the offerings, that's yours. And we want to back you for one year because we believe in you. And I said, guys, I'm going to have to pray about that. And John Paletzi stomped out, what do you mean you got to pray about it? We just offered you the moon. What's the matter with you? I said, well, John, I pray about everything. But the shocker said, John, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. He said, we'll have a meeting. How about, can everybody come next week? Everybody said, oh, yeah, we can come. So the next week we went over. And, boy, they wanted to know, well, what's your answer? I said, guys, I can't do that. I said, I don't believe God called me to auditoriums. I believe God called me to churches. John Paletti said, well, bless God, I got the biggest church around. You ain't never coming to my church again if you deny us the privilege of doing this. And I'm thinking, you idiot, you. It's costing you money. What do you care whether I do it or not? Hello? And I've never been to John Paletti's church since. Hello? But after they all got through fussing, Brother Shockley stood up and he said, Guys, I told all of you before we ever started this what he was going to say. What? He didn't tell me that. And he said, I told every one of you before we ever had the first meeting, that's what Marty Tharp was going to say. And you wouldn't listen to me. Maybe now you'll listen to him. Well, I've thought a time or two, maybe I'm, I don't know. I thought, well, after I did it, I thought maybe I missed God. But looking back, I'd do the same thing again. Amen. Because I don't believe auditorium, bless auditorium. That's wonderful. But I can tell you what, I like pastors. Amen. I like them folks. Amen. I said, I like pastors. And I like church folks. And I like them in the church where God raised them up and where God saved them and where God has anointed them and where God has got a job for them to do. I like churches. 
Amen. And I like church folks, and I like pastors. And I believe that it don't matter what size church I go to, my responsibility is singular. God called me to the churches. Amen. And he called me to do dumb auditorium. And so it's, am it's amazing to me how folks can get sidetracked by what looks like a wonderful opportunity. I've had some wonderful opportunities, but let me tell you something. I'm so happy in what I'm doing. I said I'm so happy in what I'm doing. Right now in Ireland, there's a guy that's got four theaters in one big building and about a five-acre parking lot. The biggest auditorium holds about six, 700, and they're trying to turn that thing over to me to start a church. I ain't going to start no church in Ireland. I don't feel led of God to start no church in Ireland. But I got a bunch of folks trying. Well, they can try all they want to, but unless God tells me, Hello? I said, unless God tells me, you've got to stay in what God has called you to do. Amen? Amen? I, I, got, <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling all this stuff now, but let me tell you one more. I had a guy named Dr. Akinkoya call me one day from Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. He said, he said I have four of your books, and we're going to have a convention in four months, and we're going to have service for nine days. And we want you to be the speaker all nine days. I said, where did you get my books? Gordon Brown, the guy, Gordon Brown's a friend of mine who ran television out of Dallas, Texas. And they had a program on his TV station. Gordon gave you four of my books. So I called Gordon. I said, Gordon, what in God's earth are you doing? What do you mean? I said, why'd you give that guy my books? He said, what's wrong with that? I said, Gordon, he just called me, wants me to go to Nigeria for nine days. He said, I've been invited to Niger Nigeria several times, and I've been told you've got to pay your own way, you've got to get your own hotel, you've got to buy your own food, and you've got to take them an offering. I ain't doing that. He said, Marty, you missed this one. I said, what do you mean I missed this one? He said, that church has 50,000 people. And he said, they flew me over there to just talk for five minutes about their television program and sing one song. They put me on first class. They picked me up at the airport in the longest limousine I've ever seen. Took me to a five-star hotel. And for three days, they picked me up every day, every day in that limousine, treated me absolutely royal. He said, I talked five minutes and sang one song. And when I went to get on the airplane to go home, first class, they gave me $10,000 cash. I thought, what was that guy's name again? <laughs> I had no desire. Why? Because if God's got a package, you need to not try to make a package. Are you listening to me? I said, if God has a package for you, you need not try to make a package. And just because a package appears, that don't mean it's God. I, I, I don't... I, I, even if I'd known they were going to give me 10000 the answer would have been no. I've been invited to Australia, been invited to Mexico, been invited to uh, several places in Africa. I got a, got there. We have a Bible school in Nairobi that they use my books for curriculum, and a guy over there named J. J. Feth Momongo or something like that, Mogove, I don't know what his name is, but he called me probably 30 times last year wanting me to come do the graduation. I got no desire take my time and have to cancel somebody to go. Listen, stay in where God has got you ordained. Amen? I made up my mind. I will ex agarozo, akairos, out of my chrono. I will purchase once and for all a unique moment in time out of my lifespan. And brother and sister, I'm so happy in what God has called me to do. Amen? I said, I'm so happy to do what God called me to do. What about you? I wonder if you would dare to believe that God has a package for you. Let me see your hand. Would, would you dare to believe that God has got a package for you? How many recognize one more time is not the wrapping. It's not always what it looks like. Hello. I said it's not always what it looks like. I, I said I wasn't going to tell anymore, but let me just tell you one more little story. About it's been about Miranda had only been with us maybe two years, something like that, and we got a, I, I tried to get 
I took my ATM card. We were in Northern Ireland. I took my ATM card and tried to get 50 pounds out of the bank. How many has got an ATM card? Let me see your hand. Everybody repeat after me, please. Banks are stupid! <laughs> How many knows your PIN number? <laughs> Write it down somewhere and give me your card. No, no, no. Just kidding, just kidding. Well, I tried to get 50 pounds out. Decline. Tried 20 pounds. Decline. Tried 10 pounds. Decline. I got that message. If you ain't got no money in the bank, you can't get no money out. What's wrong with them banks? Why do they give you a dumb card for it? They're not going to give you no money. Hello? <laughs> well, <laughs> The next day I got up and I had, I had uh, enough money to buy all the kids. Uh, we went to a place called Tesco's. St Stoker's been there with us. 99 pence for breakfast. And I bought a 99 pence breakfast for the whole team. I think there was five of us in the bus, wasn't there? Five. And, and when I got all done, I had two pounds left over. I had a credit card that was given to me to buy 75% of my diesel. Well, I know the old school. If you give me something, a credit card to buy diesel, I ain't buying food with it. I'm going to buy diesel with it. I ain't going to do nothing else. If somebody gives me $1,000, tells me to buy CDs, I'd, I'd have to be dying before I'd spend one cent of it on anything but CDs. And so the next day, I, I, I went and got the, filled up. And there was a long line of cars behind me. I checked my oil. I only got some oil on my hands. But I didn't take time to wash because there was this long line of cars waiting on me. And we had to, we had to go to a school in... in, in uh, uh, Ballymena called called uh, Bally High School, and I'm never late, and so I, I said I'll wash it later. So we took off down the road, and I'm telling God how disappointed I am that so many churches had promised to support us, and here we were. I ain't got a dime. I got five, six kids to feed, and I'm telling the Lord, what am I going to tell the parents when lunchtime comes and I can't even feed them? I'm working them to death. Hey, packing equipment in and out of schools a couple of times a day, sometimes on church at night, and here I can't even feed them lunch. What am I going to tell the parents when they call the parents and tell them I can't feed them lunch? <laughs> and all the way down the highway, I'm, and, and my foot got heavier and heavier, and I'm running about 70 miles an hour or more in that bus, and I saw this lay-by I had never seen before. And all of a sudden, I got the awful urge to wash my hands. I jammed on the brakes and wheeled into that lay-by. Wasn't nobody there. Boy, my wife jumped, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, nothing's wrong, I just want to wash my hands. Well, the bathroom in my coach is about as far from here to that set of seats. So by the time I got to, my, to the bathroom to wash my hands, I heard somebody was at the door. I thought, who in the world is at the door? There wasn't nobody in here when we stopped. So I went ahead and washed my hands, and I came forward, there's nobody there. And I said to Sharon, was there somebody at the door? Yeah. I said, who was it? She said, I don't know, some guy. I said, what do you want? said, he told me, have you just wait here just a few minutes? He'd be back with a little gift. Honey, when people tell me they're going to give me a little gift, most, most of the time that's exactly what they mean. But I can tell you, if you ain't got nothing but the hole in the donut and somebody done ate the crumbs, you'll wait on the gift. Amen. Because I figured if it's only 10 bucks or 10 pounds, it'd buy lunch for the kids. I'd make them have breakfast again at Tesco's. <laughs> so, so I waited, sure enough, about five to eight minutes. I'm talking on the phone to a, to a girl named Mabel up in, in, in the, uh, cold rain, and Miranda answer, answered the door, and this guy stepped up, big smile, threw an envelope up on the couch. I said, God bless you, and took off. I said, wait, 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 come back. I got off the phone and said, come back in here. I said, let me feed you a cup of coffee here. No, no, I, I'm, I'm in kind of a hurry. And I said, where do I know you from? He said, you don't know me, but I sure do know you. He said, I'm Lexi Johnson. Lexi Johnson is my, one of my best friends. Well, Lexi's the guy who booked me in all the schools for several years. And so he's gone. Couldn't, he wouldn't stick around. I gave him a couple of CDs and a couple of books, and he's gone. I looked at that little gift in that envelope. And it looked a little fat. Now, they say <laughs> that curiosity killed the cat. But I believe that satisfaction brings him back to life. 
Amen. And so I quickly looked at this envelope. It had 1,500 pounds in 20-pound notes. At the time, that was about $2,800. Hello. I had been crying for 30 miles telling God, you've forsaken me. <laughs> Got to feed these kids. <laughs> what am I going to do? What am I going to say to the parents? <laughs> It's like God said when he threw that envelope up there, shut up! <laughs> we made it the rest of the year real good because we only had just three or four weeks to go. Man, oh man, we talked about eating high on the hog. We did really good. And, and, and what is amazing is, is God has a habit of doing that for folks if you just kind of know who you are. It doesn't mean you always know who you are because I can tell you that I felt like an idiot after this happened because I'd been telling God how disgusted I was that he wasn't listening to my prayers and disgusted I was because the money hadn't come in the mail and disgusted because what am I going to do and what am I going to say but I can tell you that God's still in control I said he's still in control everybody repeat after me I will let Sagarozo Akairos out of my chronos I will purchase once and for all a unique moment in time out of my lifespan. I ain't done, I quit. Everybody stand up. See, I'm a firm believer that when God tells you to do something, uh, you don't argue with God. I said you don't argue with God. I'm convinced that if God sends you, see, if, you, if, if God sends you around the world, but you only got enough money to go across the street, if you don't go across the street, you ain't never going around the world. We've had it happen to us more than once. But we just went until our money ran out, trusting that it's up to God then. As long as I got money in my pocket, I can't blame God. But when I'm willing to go until I ain't got nothing but God, God steps up. And God will step up for you. All of you here tonight that would like for God to step up to your package and help you open it and come down here and join me. You'd like for God to help you step up to your package and help you open it up. Come on down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See, I, I'm, I'm so totally convinced. I, I, I hate to bore you with one more story, but it comes to my mind, so it must be the Lord wants me to share it with you. We got up one morning on our way to a school at Mockerfelt. Had no money, and I do mean I didn't even have an ATM card at that time. I didn't have a credit card of any kind. No money. And my gauge was outside in that old bus you guys rode in. The gauge was outside. You had to go outside and look through this hole, and there's the gauge. I went out that morning and looked at that tank, and I was shocked. It had ran out on me before when it was right on empty. I looked at that gauge, it was below empty. And I got back in the bus and I said, baby, you, we need to pray because we got to go to the first school and we don't have any diesel and we don't have any money. She said, well, we, we can't start at the school because what happens that narrow road between here and there? What happens if we run out of diesel? We will block the whole roadway. And I said, Sharon, if we don't go, it's our problem. If we do go and run out, it's God's problem. And I believe God can handle it better than I can. So we're going. We had just got a cell phone. And my cell phone rang. And there's a guy there named J James McKeever. He's what they call an albino, albino. He, he can read a watch if he does this. And he called me and he said, Marty, 
you're going to Mockerfield, right? To the high school? I said, that's right. He said, if I have somebody drive me there, can I go with you to the next school? Because the next school is where I went to school, Mockerfield. I said, sure, James, come on. So he met me at the school. And when we started to leave the school, Sharon, because it's 20 miles, we made it, didn't run out. And that gas gauge is laying clear on that little thing that stopped it from going any further. And Sharon said, Mahara is another 15 miles. And James said, I got to go by and see my mother for just a minute. I said, James, that's six miles out of the way. I'm not going to tell this Catholic kid that I ain't got no money, I'm broke, I ain't got no diesel. I'm not going to tell that kid that. I said, no, we can't do it. He said, Brother Marty, it ain't going to hurt anything to stop by and see my mother for just a couple of minutes. I need to. And I said, James, you saw your mother this morning. We don't, we don't have the time. He said, yes, you do. I know how far it is. I know you can take me by to see my mother. I finally gave up and thought, all right, all right. So they have a three-acre plot up above their house, their trucking industry. And there's one pipe sticking up about that high out of the ground. And this kid who can't see his hand in front of his face is out there backing me up by that pole. And I'm thinking, you idiot, James, I can see the dumb pole. Back me right up and stop me. What I couldn't see was on the other side was a pump. Pulled that hose off, stuck that in my tank, and turned it on. Diesel. Ran down to see his mother, and he came back. The thing was running over, and I said, James, I think it's full. Just want to make sure. It's running out of the ground. So, so we went to the school, and after the school was over with, he said, y'all had anything to eat? I said, James, you've been with us all day. Did you see us eat? We didn't have nothing in the bus to eat. And he said, I want to take y'all to a good place that I really like. Took us to an expensive hotel. He didn't ask us what we wanted. Everybody likes steaks. And he bought us all steaks. About $20 a piece, American money. And then he insisted we have coffee. That was five pounds for a cup of coffee. Dessert was seven pounds ninety-five for a cup of coffee. For a dessert, he bought us dessert. He bought us coffee, and I'm thinking I should do something to help out. And I get my two pounds I got in my pocket, and when I put them on the table, he put a bruise on top of my hand. He hit my hand so hard, that made me aggravated. Boy, he hit me hard. I told you I'm dying. You put that back in your pocket. Then after we eat, he said, "Can you take me back to my mother's?" Boy, you think I told him. I said, sure, James, no problem. <laughs> he said, Mom has put on some cookies and, and or call them biscuits over there. Mom's baked some biscuits and she's got the tea on. She wants y'all to come and visit for a few minutes. What am I going to say? I said, okay. So we went in and we had tea and we had cookies and we visited for a few minutes. When we started to leave, his mother gave me a big hug and a handshake and left something in my hand that was all folded up. When we got outside, I stuck it in my pocket. And when I got outside, quick as we're out of sight, I, I was, he was a check for 500 pounds. I started the day dead broke, no diesel, no food. Ended the day with a full belly, 500 pounds, a full tank of diesel. And the only reason is because I refused to see my circumstances and let them hold me back. Are you listening? I could have said, you're right, we'll probably run out all the way there. No, no. You got to keep going. I said, you got to keep going. Stay the course. Everybody get a hold of somebody's hand. Father, I just believe you right now in the name of Jesus. There is no telling what God has got ordained for these people. There is no telling, Lord, what they're capable of doing. I ask of you, Lord, that you would give them the mind of the Holy Ghost. Let the power of the Spirit touch them to understand who they are in you and what their abilities are. And Lord, don't let them be limited by what they see. Lord, let them move on what they know you are capable of. In the name of Jesus. God, we rebuke every spirit that would try to hold us back. And we ask you, Lord, to give us the courage and give us the strength and fortitude to move forward in you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hi, I'm Pastor George Stover of Wellspring Church of All Nations, right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. 
And I want to invite you to come and join this growing congregation as we hold forth the word of the living God and move in the spirit of power. Maybe you've been to church before and, and you, just, you just didn't connect. You didn't connect with the people. You didn't connect with God. You just didn't connect. I want you to come and just give it a try one more time. Just come one more time and see if the living God will not touch you by his spirit in our services. We meet at 1045 on Sunday morning and 6 p.m. Sunday evening. Wednesdays at 6.30. We want to be available to you because you are why we're here. And we want to connect you with the Lord of glory, with Jesus Christ, and, and teach you how to move in his spirit so that you can live the life Jesus came to provide, abundance and more abundantly. So come and join us. Wellspring Church of All Nations, 4870 Janelle Drive or 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. Entrances on both streets. Come see us. We love, we're looking forward to meeting you and being with you. God bless you.